GNT show is intended for mature audiences. Parental discretion is advice. Live long and prosper, bitches. friends with benefits <laughs> speaking of having a good time terry mm-hmm. dayton broke <laughs> the gnt show this is now the david mac <laughs> appreciation <laughs> hour <Peter>. you assholes <laughs> <laughs> what is it about this guy that people love him so much with his purple velvet cape and his crown i thought it was a little much when he had us carry him in the studio on a throne i am awesome <laughs> <laughs> Look what I have brought upon the world! There is an urge to go nyan 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 nyan. I heard rumors that you might be working on something else, but we won't pry much. <laughs> I'm, say it. I'm gonna pry a little. <laughs> dare you! How dare you ask me to change it? Do you not understand the majesty of my genius? <laughs> and the guy sitting next to me looked at me like he was, you know, like I'd cramped in his hat. Yeah, it's the professionalism yeah. that sells the show, that's right. And welcome to this edition of the GNT Show Supplemental Logs. Joe Lon True, I am Gettysburg Seven, also known as Nick. Over to my right, your left, there's the lovely Terry. Good evening and good morning, everyone, depending on when you're listening to this. Very good. Tonight, wearing his Gorton's Fisherman outfit <laughs> for this interview with the big yellow rain slicker in the hat, but still with his Klingon armor underneath, Ceridium. Kapla. And it is our pleasure to have as our guest for this special ad- additional log, the Dean Martin of the Martin and Lewis of Star Trek <laughs> fiction. Because, you know, if Mac, Mac would have to be Frank, am I right? Yeah. Are, 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 we doing, are, are we doing the Rat Pack? I've just interrupted my interruction. Please, I'll just... No, I'll no, that's fine. Yeah, well, if we're doing the Rat Pack, then you're the Peter Lawford. Oh, no, 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 no. If I'm doing the Rat Pack, I'm the Joey Bishop. I mean, <laughs> oh, Dayton is the Joey Bishop. Come no, on. I think Dayton's the Sammy. Dayton's the Sammy. Unless he does Keith's have that eye. Sammy. Yeah, he does have that eye that kind of. <laughs> 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 the wandering eye. You know, then Mark Lewis is the Peter Lawford. on truck stop bathrooms from here to Portland, Maine. <laughs> That then Marco would be the Peter Lawford. <laughs> He's the Peter something. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Kevin Dillmore, let's give him a hand. Oh, that, wow. Well, it's, it is it is absolutely a pleasure to be here. I know this is something that uh, you have given uh, Dayton the floor to a number of times, and I'm, I'm flattered to be asked myself. Now, who would be the Angie Dickinson? Me. No. Uh, yes. That's it. <laughs> she's not I, one of the writers. She's not. She's not. Oh. Been to Shore. Gosh, I, 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 Shorely, I would, drunk I mean, my, vote, my vote would be for uh, for Kirsten Byer. You know. There you go. But, I, I can uh, live with that. But second. could be uh, if, if only because I've you know she's she's indulged in roasts that we had done in past years in Shoreleave. So. I'm trying to think of who was the really attractive woman. She had on a mini skirt with the boots up past her knees. That was in the Rat Pack? Well, Angie Dickinson. No, no, no. She from Shore Leave. She was one of the writers. Oh, that must have been that must have been Sissy. That must have been Amy Sisson. And she loves when I call her Sissy. Yeah, so so that's her. She could be the engineer. Tells me that's a, a bit. Are you, are you being facetious? No, she doesn't like that at all. I'm not. In fact, I was told I couldn't use that nickname in public, so I would never call her sissy on a podcast or something. Well, hello, sissy. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but of the of the two of you, you're definitely the Dean Martin his, to, to Dayton's Jerry Lewis. Wow, that's I'm I'm pleased. I'm flattered. I'm not going to croon or anything. But I do kind of like Dino. I was going to say, you don't have to. Just stand there, look cool, hold a scotch in your hand, you're all right. Yeah. If I was going to stand someplace and look cool, there'd have to be scotches in everyone else's hand. <laughs> well, you may not know this, but the G&T show is partially born from the fruit of your efforts. Wow. This I've, started I've, because of Terry and I's fandom of Vanguard. Oh, wow. Well, that's cool. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. that's something I'm very proud to be involved in, so uh, Our, that's, that's very flattering. Our yeah, we'll have to scrub with all the forty sevens. So, all right. Well, although the forty seven tradition in Star Trek predates uh, Vanguard by, by a number of well, years. Know. No, but we were the forty sevens because that's what we were calling fans of the Vanguard series. Oh, cool. Okay. See, I, I wasn't. I was. I wasn't aware of that. The Vanguardians. What else did we have, Terry? Oh. <laughs> what? 
Pennington lovers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was absolutely no, I, I'm good with that because he was my favorite character of the whole smash but then I've got a background in journalism so he was the guy that I gravitated toward when we first started busting around to decide what we were going to do with the second book oh, he was well, no the, the story that you did for the set of novellas Mm-hmm. I, I guess you would call them a set of novellas That's um, true. with Pennington as the main character I was just I love that. I loved it so much. Yes, and you you did something there in a Star Trek book, novella, story, whatever we want to call it, that is rarely done, and you wrote it in the first person. Can you can you talk about that with us? Well, I I did that for a couple of reasons, and now I I'm trying to think. The only other Star Trek stories that I can think of off the top of my head, correct me if I'm wrong, which I frequently am, Did uh, were Battle Stations and uh, Dreadnought in uh, in first person? Or were those <sighs> told through the eyes of a crew member? They were, told through, senior the, staff? they were told through the eyes of that crew member who became that was it. Okay. way too close to a friend of Kirk's in the second book for how fast. Yeah. So, yeah, sorry, I could, sorry, I could remember what, what Ryan did with that. No, that's okay. But uh, the Captain's Table books was yes. that, uh, that John Ordover edited with the uh, task of, uh, of going through with, you know, giving each uh, captain the yeah, opportunity to books. tell a story from the first person, more or less. And, and, I and love those. those. So yeah, I enjoyed them a lot. The, uh, uh, in fact, uh, I, I don't know what uh, other people might say, but I would say that Peter's book on uh, Calhoun in that series is among, you know, the, the best, you know, two or three, you know, maybe even the best two of New Frontier books for me personally. Uh, I, and I am such a fan of New Frontiers. Yeah. So, well, it was really cool. I mean, it was, I mean, it was an opportunity to, you know, basically do a, a TV series with an unlimited budget. But as far as, <laughs> That's a, I, mean, I mean, really, I mean, it's, 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 no, you're uh, right. It's a great yeah. way of putting it. I guess my my whole my I mean there were two books that I reread when I was uh, you know messing around with hard news and uh, one of them was a Fletch book and uh, and I really enjoy uh, I mean if, if you've ever the the movie's fun movie's fun but if you ever get a chance to to actually uh, go back to uh, McDonald's books and read the uh, um, and read the way you know Fletch showed up in print you know that's uh, it's just kind of fun I mean just getting in the head of a journalist. Because when you tell a good journalism story, at least for, for in my mind, it's about the slow reveal. I mean, where you really go into, uh, you know, it's, I mean, reporter as detective, because the writing process is boring as hell. You know, you're not going to, you know, well, in chapter one, uh, I sat down with a typewriter and decided I was going to do this, you know, which is why, you know, Pennington tends to work with a recorder because he right. can kind of, you know, basically, you know, write on the fly. But that was my whole idea was just to kind of, you know, make it, and I re, and I re read uh, some uh, Dashiell Hammett with the idea of, you know, and there's, and there have been uh, some, uh, some people who've read the story and, and I would not argue with that, that say that as far as, you know, I mean, whodunits or mysteries go, uh, you know, this, this isn't the most complex to figure out <laughs> and, and that's perfectly fine. But my whole idea was to just get into uh, Pennington's mindset, uh, especially since I was uh, not involved in open secrets. It was just this kind of window of how did we get from the end of Reap the Whirlwind to, you know, with, uh, with Pennington being at this place in, uh, with his uh, feelings for uh, T'Pau and, uh, and uh, wait, I didn't say that, right? To Prin. Sorry. <laughs> they, well, uh, that's a Vulcan thing. They're all the same. Uh, no, so they're not. Yeah. <laughs> Just be careful. Careful. He gets all feisty. I'm teasing. The, uh, to uh, the decision in Open Secrets where he said, you know, I'm going to, you know, basically give up everything that, uh, you know, walk away from, you know, potentially the biggest story, his job, I mean, everything. I'm going to walk away from that and uh, accompany her to Vulcan. I felt like if Star Trek fiction is basically sewing blocks into a quilt, which is kind of a fun way for me to think about it is that, you know, I mean, we've just got this big quilt that is the 23rd, 24th century, whatever you want to call it, and mm-hmm. some places you need some blocks sewn in, and I felt like that was one I could sew, so that's what I did. Well, it was a great story and, and it's well, a you. fabulous character and one well, that my favorites that that uh, they, you know because David and Marco uh, are the ones responsible for developing the majority of the characters that came out because when we wrote the second book we had the manuscript for Harbinger there and Mac had uh, set up a uh, cast list um, I think he's released it on his oh, website oh yeah boy have we um, we have read that Bible trust me. Mm. 
<laughs> so, and we followed it. I mean, there were some there were there were opportunities for us to do casting when uh, Dayton and I fleshed out the uh, uh, endeavor and did a little bit of casting above and beyond what was uh, you know what was in the Bible, but. Uh, yeah, that was just, I mean, it was just a, a fun place to start, and given the opportunity that I had to just kind of play with Pennington and throw at him what I think, because eventually he uh, is going to become a journalist that at least has engendered the respect from you know a level of people within the 23rd Century Federation to have a journalism school named after him. And I went to a journalism school that was named after a uh, a very well revered Kansas journalist, and you know I just kind of had an idea of of you know how he got to where he was to the point that you know University of Kansas named their J school after him. What, Jason Whitlock. Uh, <laughs> yes. How would you have guessed? <laughs> I've met Mr. Whitlock a couple of times. He would never know. He would never remember, but I have. So well, like, um, maybe one other person got that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you had me, so that's good enough. I mean, I was there. And, uh, William Allen White, there's your trivia question. William Allen White School of Journalism and Mass Communications was what I got my degree from. And so I thought, well, what kind of person is Pennington going to be, you know, to, to get to a point where he has a school named after him? And so I think that uh, my hope with hard news was if we never get another opportunity, maybe we can just kind of get into his head to see, you know, I mean, the types of decisions that a uh, journalist can make that are responsible ones that nobody sees the thought process of who's writing for a publication as to what gets in and gets out of a story. And that's, you know, I mean, I worked in a small town uh, newspaper. I I was a news editor for twice weekly for a town of 5,000 people with a readership of about 18,000. And, you know, I went everywhere. I mean, I went on ride-alongs with the sheriff. I was in judges' chambers when I was covering trials. You know, I was hanging out all over the place because, I had developed a uh, level of trust with the uh, people who were making decisions in uh, in that area where they would say, this is the background that you need to know so you can write the story, and actually these are some facts that you need to know so you can write around them, uh, which sometimes needs to happen in crimes when you have victims whose identity uh, should be protected and right. not released. You know, so uh, again, it's it's not a function of... Uh, I wanted Pennington to be a guy that you wouldn't hide stuff from because you knew he was going to be responsible enough to use it and not use it, which actually ended up being a pretty pivotal you know, uh, aspect of his character throughout Vanguard. I mean, you know, the, the opportunities that he of, of things that he had to learn, uh, the decisions that he made to uh, conceal or reveal, and that was an opportunity. I mean, you know, I mean, something that Duprin played him against, and uh, something that uh, that Reyes banked on it for. Yes, and, and that's and, the and, one thing I was just going to say is that if there was one thing that Reyes did. It was he had already engendered that kind of trust because Reyes knew exactly what he would do with the information mm-hmm. he gave mm-hmm. him, and he relied on that. Yeah, he, even to the detriment of his own career. Mm-hmm. And you know, there are things that we know people will do because we're just familiar with their character, and there's things that we know people will do because we know that person will do the right thing. And there's a difference. And Reyes knew that Pennington would do the right thing um, when it came to uh, information that he was that he was given uh, of a very sensitive nature. That I mean, that you know, a phrase that gets thrown around lightly, but you know, the the entire Federation was at stake with some of the stuff that was happening at the Taurus Reach. Well, and, uh, you know, and- Go ahead, Nick. Speaking on on something like that, with like something like the the Corps of Engineers series or something like that, have you ever thought about trying to get a Federation news series service or series like that going? You know, I never pushed for it. It was something that I think people were leaning more into uh, the Jake Sisko character on the FNS. Um, you mm-hmm. know, really, there's no. I'm not aware of any 23rd century character aside from Pennington that you know appeared in. I'm sure there were, but uh, I think the uh, um, Federation News Service, if that's what it was called back in the day, you know, played background roles in some stories. For some reason, I'm thinking that it, that it might have been uh, in Prime Directive. Um, you know, maybe some uh, mm-hmm. some some well, news story stuff. Well, in the beginning, I would have of to say, I mean, I think that Pennington, at least for me, and in, admittedly, I haven't read all of the uh, Star Trek books. You know, how could anybody really do that? But unless he started. <laughs> A long time ago. But the one thing I appreciated the most about the Vanguard series, especially with Pennington, was for once we I felt like a, I really got to follow a main character of a series of books 
set in the Star Trek universe who wasn't a member of Starfleet. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. extraordinarily rare for a lot of the, the stories that had been told up until that point. And that's part of the reason why he I became so you know enamored with him. Yeah, I, I think that's something that, you know, while Dayton and I have had some fun opportunities to do stuff within the structure of a Starfleet-focused story, really with the SCE books, with Vanguard, in a sense, when we've gone off and written stuff with, uh, with Mirror Universe, we've been able to do things that don't necessarily adhere to uh, what feels like a traditional Starfleet story. You know, I would think that if you, I mean, if we really, you know, were draw a line down, down the center of what we do, the majority of stuff would fall on the side of this isn't necessarily a straight up Starfleet story. And that's what I enjoyed about SCE as well. That's very true. Well, again, you know, congratulations on Pennington and the work that you got to do with him and hard, uh, hard news and the rest of the Vanguard series. Too. It was just you're very uh, gracious. Thank you. Really? No, no, I mean it. <laughs> you're, I take it that the era of Star Trek that you prefer the most is TOS? Yeah. Is that- um, somebody had once said, the person that I think said it to me first was Dean Wesley Smith, so uh, I'm going mm-hmm. I'm to point it to him, and, and he can in turn point it to the real source. When somebody talks about what's the golden age of science fiction, uh, the golden age of science fiction is 13. Whatever you were into when you were 13 is probably going to set a hook in you deep enough that you're going to always kind of revisit it, go back to it, compare stuff to it. You know, it's always going to be your your benchmark, and it's absolutely proven true for me. You know, when uh, when I mean, on my birthday, on my 13th birthday, I was sitting in a uh, movie theater in Colorado Springs seeing Star Wars for the second time, and uh, in 1977, and I had like the week before stumbled through a bookstore and found uh, the Star Trek Concordance that uh, B. Joe Trimble did oh, with, yeah. that, that. with the spinner cover, you know, the, the yes, you know, primary, had it. Cell or primary hole on it. Yeah. Badass stuff. But, uh, you know, so when I look at, you know, what it is that, uh, you know, to, to borrow the expression from, uh, from Bender and Breakfast Club, pumps my nads, I definitely go to TOS, uh, the animated series, and the classic uh, trilogy of Star Wars movies when it comes to, to video. And then I was reading uh, a lot of Bradbury, a lot of Heinlein back then. You know, I mean, those, uh, those are kind of the things that when I get to the core of what I really dig, it, it ends up falling right there. That would explain why Colonel Willem Deering. Anyway. Oh, no, see, that's Dayton. That's Dayton. <laughs> he was really big on Will Deering and uh, Princess Bra- Ardella. I was, uh, well, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I was, I was ISIS. Um, <gasps> oh, was, my God. Terry, we were just talking, talking about her. There you go. I was... Yeah, I was Isis and I was Electro Woman and Dyna Girl. Dyna Man, those Girl. yes, and those things got me through a uh, you know a uh, delayed adolescence. They ushered many. Yes, who boy? Gray. Aaron Gray back in the day, and also uh, Apollo's sister, the dark-haired girl on Battlestar yeah. Galactica. Yeah, was that Anne? Oh, you see, I want to say Anne, ha- Anne Lockhart. Yes. Yep. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. Who was that? It was Anne Lock- No, Anne Lockhart came from the Pegasus. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. See, I don't remember. Athena? Then I'm, not, I'm an Athena. Yeah. See, she was I, Athena. Are you sure? Oh, I'm positive because yeah, I have. I think you're right. I'm not as conversant with the uh, 78 Battlestar as I ought to be. But uh, yeah, I, but I met a... Lockhart <laughs> in Denver once, and she was she was gorgeous. But yeah, my goal someday I will meet uh, someday I will meet Isis, and uh, get pretty excited about that particular moment in history. Yes, because it was the. Sh- Shazam ISIS Power Hour. Well, that was after, they, I mean, that was when they combined it, yeah, but originally they just kind of ran them together. Shazam was on before ISIS. I think that, I think Shazam was on for a season before uh, before they, uh, you know, it got popular enough they decided to do a second show. Marin Jensen played Athena. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. Nice work. She's 56 <laughs> years old now. Ah, uh, that's okay. Yeah. Cool. Joanne Lumley's probably about the same. Oh, she's got Epstein-Barr syndrome. Ouch. Oh, that's sad. She's the long. She was a longtime companion of singer-songwriter Don Henley. Wow. Well, I didn't know that. Not know that either. Oh, here's one for you. She was on the Hardy Boys Nancy Drew Mysteries. That I knew. That I knew. <laughs> Pamela Are C. you Martin, kidding? Another, I had, another... like, Sean Cassidy plastered all over my room. And here's a shock. She was on the <laughs> Battle of the Network Stars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, see, uh, when, that, when Pamela Sue Martin uh, left uh, the Nancy Drew show and uh, posed for Playboy, I think that was Wait, the what? first. Oh, yeah. 
Welcome, welcome to my world, sir. She posed for Playboy, and that was the first copy of Playboy that I actually stole from my parents. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I went up and looked at, you know, and, uh, and and perused, you know, because you know Bradbury and Stephen King and a number of other notables were writing at the time. You know, the, the Playboy uh, interview, very highly recommended for young journalists and boobies. But the uh, what I did, yeah, there is a book out there of just the Playboy interviews. For yes, those there that- is. To get into journalism, and quite we use that in my journalism school. Yeah, it's a. Yeah, it's also uh, there's a CD-ROM that has them all as well. But yeah, there were. I mean, the Q and A's. Um, in fact, the Q and A really the basis of those Q and A's when I had to do them. Uh, well, I shouldn't say had to. I was hired by John Ordover to do um, uh, Q and A's in the back of the uh, of a few digests that I think John called the Signature Series. Do you guys remember those? No, I. Um, so. There's there's um, about uh, six or eight of them when they were taking popular novels and um, and mashing and, and putting them in trade paperbacks. There was one for uh, that combined uh, uh, memory memory alpha is that right memory prime memory prime and prime directive, um, huh. which were Judy Reeve Stevens um, in, initial books in Star Trek. Uh, there was okay. one there was one that uh, combined uh, the two Amzadi books. Um, oh, I have that one. Okay. There's one that combined the first two Stargazer books, and there's uh, one that combined some of Greg Cox's work, and I can't remember now which ones. Which I don't think there were the Q books, but I maybe think they were the they con were. books. No, I don't. Well, I don't think so because I think these were contemporary with those. I, I'd had to. I, my phone is plugged in, um, or I I jump up and and run into the <laughs> to the book and look. But in any event, the uh, those were called the signature series, and I was invited by John to uh, interview those writers and do what he said. They're basically the print versions of the audio commentary on a DVD. And actually, they were a lot of fun. They were, I mean, they were the, the first chance that I got it to talk at length with Peter David and Gar and Judy Reeve Stevens. I had spoken to Greg Cox before, and I'd spoken to Mike Friedman before. Um, but those were the, the interviews that I did. And uh, they were all of them were so friendly and so fun. And uh, I got some really cool stuff out of them. And, uh, yeah, those, that, was, that may be... You know, aside from you know, a couple. If I was going to point to a couple of things, I was really, really proud of back in those days. Uh, I was very excited about being involved in those signature series books. You know, I want to touch back on something that you were talking about a little bit when we first started talking about the character of Pennington, and you had made mention about some of the books that kind of had inspired his character and the work. Uh-huh. Uh, some of the um, Dashiell Hammett books and things like that. And I seem to recall oh, there was another set that you had touched on. I can't remember what it was. Fletch. Fletch. Yes, it was Fletch. And I and I just wanted to say, you know, I, I just wanted to kind of bring it up and ask you because Fletch were definitely the books that at least when they first came out for women my age, girls didn't read them. But the fact that girls found out that their boyfriends read it all mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was always it was typically a Fletch book. It was like the guys would be like reading a paperback kind of hidden by a sports magazine. Uh-huh. And you know, it's like, what do you mean you're reading? Well, I'm reading a book. You're reading a book? You know, it was like <laughs> you? You're reading a book? Yeah, well it was always Fletch. Kind of mean did you to... grow up with? Teenage boys, you know? It wasn't cool <laughs> to be smart in the seventies, I guess. Uh, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I hear you. I hear you, but no, I, you know, I didn't discover him until I went to, I was uh, in college in the eighties and that's when, yeah. when I discovered yeah. him. Uh, I truly went, went to the source material with the movie, but, uh, and, and they predate the movie by quite a bit. Right. Um, Would you agree but, an underrated movie, the first one? I don't know that it's underrated because I think it was hugely popular at the time and remains popular with the people who loved it then. Now, do I think that it's underappreciated these days? Yes. I think um, it holds up extremely well. I do. I, I think I think it holds up very well. Chevy Chase's comedy is really good in it. I figure that since it is a uh, since it's a character that people have flirted on and off with revisiting, that that speaks not you know because the movie needs to be remade, but because the character is worth revisiting. Who would you have Here's, playing him? Oh God! And uh, you I, know what? I, I, I automatically disqualify Will Ferrell. Oh no, no, he's too old. If you're exactly. going to go straight with the books, if you're going to go straight with the books, even Chevy Chase was too old when he played him. Fletch was not as old as Chevy Chase at that stage of the game, you know, as far as the as far as the books go. Really, Fletch, even though he was married several times, you know, should be in his early 30s. Um, Jay Moore? Uh, Too old now? You know, well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Fletch is not, I mean, Fletch as a film 
you know, the character in the film was definitely, you know, played by Chevy Chase, but Chevy Chase kind of uh, molded the character to inhabit him, okay? I mean, if you watch if you watch Fletch and you watch Caddyshack, it's the same thing. I mean, it's the same thing. Right. And, oh, and, I'm laughing right. already. <laughs> and, and, it's, and as much as, and, you know, and I, and I'm telling you, there's not too many movies that, uh, that I love more than Caddyshack. And it's not a criticism of anything, but that's just, I mean, that's what, I mean, what Will Ferrell is now, where it's basically, we, we have Will Ferrell being Will Ferrell in a role that you and I know he is horribly unsuited to fill, but yet in the universe of the movie, he is respected and revered for his ability to do it well. <clears throat> you know, who knows? But that's the secret to every Will Ferrell movie that succeeds. Okay. Yeah. Um, Will Ferrell's an ice skater? No. Well, it, it works in Blades of Glory. You know, Will Ferrell's a newscaster? No. Well, it works in Anchorman. You know, Will Ferrell's a NASCAR driver? No. Nope. Well, it works in Ricky Bobby. You know, I mean, it's because that's you know in in the in the universe that he inhabits. Then you know he's is great at what he does, and people think he's great at what he does for whatever reason. Uh, if only he was great at acting. The <laughs> <laughs> the uh, um, but the the character of Fletch. Hang on just a second. I'm, see us what happens when I run off of the mouth. I got to take a drink. <laughs> when, oh, he's uh, having he's having a uh, a State of the Union rebuttal Artois. address. Yeah, Artois. yeah. Um, by virtue of the fact that's what was in the fridge, the uh, the character of Fletch had his his wise assery stuff, but but he really was was much more biting. He was much more of a cynic than a wise ass. He was a little he was hardened too early for his years. He mm-hmm. was uh you know, he suspected everything as not being on the up and up. He was not very good at life. I mean, you know, the thing is that Chevy Chase is a smooth mofo and and you expect him to be able to glide through just about any problem. Um but I mean, which was kind of a disconnect with Fletch in a sense because, you know, I mean Fletch was not the smartest. I mean, he's he's very very smart, but he just he just stumbles around and 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 ends up in in uh, in fixes before he knows it. And I think that part of my the question was going to lead to is an along those lines. Then, you know, what were you said you spoke about Bradbury and others? What are some of the books that you find yourself kind of constantly, or, or novelists even uh, constantly, that you find yourself going back as a writer and being inspired by, or or even relying um, on? Who do I read? Well, the number my number one. I mean, the 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 writer who no matter what is written, I will seek out, I will buy, and I will read is Joe R. Lansdale. I, I think that he is a wonderfully fun storyteller. Everything he writes is a page turner. If anybody wants to check out some Joe Lansdale, um, they absolutely should get a book called The Bottoms which people compare, and I, I think favorably, to Kill a Mockingbird. Many of his books are set in East Texas you know, in various time frames. I would also recommend any uh, the start at the beginning, and I'm trying to remember if the first one might be uh, called Savage Season, but he writes a series of books that feature two uh, uh, characters, uh, Hap Collins and Leonard Pine. People call them the Hap and Leonard books, uh, and they're just a couple of, of guys in East Texas who uh, will do anything to turn a buck, and, uh, and they <laughs> get into some pretty hairy stuff. There's a book called uh, Leather Maiden that's about a guy... I was going to say, I'm waiting, for, I'm waiting for him to kick in on that. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, it's no. About... I'm just thinking of uh, Felicia Day and Steampunk. I don't know why. Oh, wait. wait what? <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Leather Maiden's about a guy who uh, was working for a big newspaper and uh, uh, was sleeping with the uh, wife of the editor-in-chief and got busted out and ended up ends up taking a uh, kind of a hack job with uh, his hometown paper going back home. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, um, I think it's a twice weekly or something. He's living with his dad and uh and and starts digging around and finds out that there's all sorts of crap going on in his hometown that he doesn't like it's really it's good hard-boiled storytelling and uh a lot of dialogue driven which is another thing i like about mcdonald's writing in the fletch books and also uh, yeah. uh the flynn books um which uh or the, was a police character francis x flynn who uh um spun out of the fletch books i still read uh, i go back and read hunter thompson i know that a lot of people are pretty critical of his stuff as he uh, grew uh, older and more drug addled. I would argue that uh, the stuff that he did uh, before he became his own character was uh, is, is 
still wonderful journalism. The uh, Hells Angels, Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail. Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas is just, I mean, it, it's, it's an American classic as far as I'm concerned. But uh, and I'm read, I read his, uh, his first novel that got made into a movie by Johnny Depp called The Rum Diary. And uh, mm-hmm. it was one of the coolest stories about journalists that I've read in a really long time. Those if, are, you'd like I mean, to something, if you'd like to read something different, may I suggest the Dreg City series by Kelly Metting? <laughs> yeah, I'm in. You're a good man. There you Thank go. you. <laughs> Thank you. The, I'm um, in. Uh, and I no, read a ton of comic books. I mean, that's. I mean, you know, that's the thing. You know, I mean, I was going to people... ask. Do you? I was going to ask. What other? What other genres do you read? I was into comics before I was into Star Trek. I uh, still read more comics than I do science fiction. I'm fairly narrow. I admit I don't read a whole lot of Marvel. I, so you're, uh, am... wait, you're a DC guy? Oh God, yes. Thank you for Live... tuning in this week to G and T Show <laughs> Supplemental Logs. Our guest oh, was Kevin. On. Nice. Nice. I like to see as well. Did I just wait? I, I, you guys went. Bl- oh, you guys went blank as soon as as soon as Nick started talking. I thought, holy shit, they cut me off. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Terry and I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago that Batman and Batgirl, that whole the whole Bruce Wayne thing, is actually more fitting for the Marvel universe than it is for the DC universe. Uh, yes, but every every character has its anomaly. Um, the difference between the DC, really, the difference between the DC universe and the Marvel universe is summed up, I think, between the differences in Superman and Spider-Man. And when it comes right down to it, Superman uh, is Clark Kent because he has to be, and Peter Parker is Spider-Man because he has to be. And that's but Superman's the a dick. There's even a web page called superdickery.com. <laughs> oh, I know. I love that web page. I love it's that awesome. web page. It's yeah, but it's ha, but where no, do you fall Superman, on the Aquaman issue? Hey, careful! I'm um, asking him. The man's have you, obviously uh, bright. <laughs> Boy, I've got you fooled. Um, have you? Uh, have you, you remember? Uh, <laughs> Well, that I mean, that narrows it down. The, uh, the have you guys uh, if, are any of you familiar with what's been going on in this comic for the last year and a half? Terry, oh, yeah, from Aqu- yeah, I sub- I actually started to subscribe to my first comic books this past year. Um, oh, good for you. Yeah, I'm, I've I never walked into a comic book store in my life until the new Fifty Two came out. A couple of and it was and a couple of people were very kind and gave me the because they knew I liked Aquaman from when I was young. And so they, I, I started up on the Aquaman series this past time around, and uh, along with three or four others. I like started with Batgirl and mm-hmm. Aquaman, with, uh, voiced Aquaman. by the same guy who was the handler of Electra Woman and Dyna Girl. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I would have handled them. Oh, yeah. oh, but, hey. And oh. then, and then Mr. Ceridium here it got me my first Aquaman maquette. So. Hey, nice. That was yeah. very kind of you. So, yeah, I like what DC's doing with New 52. I mean, it's it's kind of, I mean, you know, the, uh, and, I mean, that's, your mileage may vary. I mean, you know, yes. I mean, Marvel books are different from DC books. I just know what I like. Now, that said, I'm a huge fan of Marvel's, uh, um, you know, from the from the 70s. As many things as I love about DC, if I was going to pick a favorite super, t- super team, I love the Defenders. But especially because the Defenders uh-huh. were written by Steve Gerber, and Steve Gerber is one of my all-time favorite writers, and, and Howard the Duck is one of my all-time favorite comics. I'm reading a book now that I tell you what, man. If there's if there's anything that anybody takes away from all the bullshit that I'm spewing tonight, take this away. Go to a comic store. Go to the graphic novel section and purchase volume one of a comic called Saga. It's the newest comic by Brian K. Vaughn, who is uh, a writer of uh, comics including Ex Machina and a book that may be my favorite comic ever, uh, Why the Last Man. And Saga is... Uh, I saw this. Yeah. Okay. And I'm telling you, Saga is as cool as Star Wars. I've read it's, uh, the 10th issue is the latest one on the stand. The, uh, graph, the, the graphic novel is uh, the first six issues, and you'll need to get it because if you want to, if you want to, if you're one of those single issue buyers, you, I mean, good luck because uh, I think the yeah. number one is going on eBay for 60 or 70 bucks. So wow. save your money. Just watch the. Uh, but but Brian Brian K. Vaughn is a wonderful storyteller. He has packed more imagination and more memorable characters in uh, in those first six issues than anything I've seen happen in a comic in a very long time, probably since the last one he did that I liked, which was Why. Well, but my gosh, buy Saga read, and read it. Did you read The Long Halloween and Dark Knight Returns and all of those? And then, and Not, then how do you think Christopher Nolan's vision in cinema taking that kind of the, the graphic novel Dark Knight meshed up with, with that? 
Hmm. Okay. Well, let's we'll, we'll take it in two parts. I was reading comics when I was in college, and uh, and Dark Knight and Watchmen were coming out at about the same time in the eighties, and I read them both. And uh, little did I know at the time that those comics would end up, um, you know, taking the uh, the pendulum of comic storytelling and shoving it so far into that direction that it wouldn't come out for twenty years. Wow. Um, yeah. You know, I really enjoyed Dark Knight Returns when it was happening because it was fresh. I loved Watchmen when it was happening because it was fresh. I still love Watchmen. I don't return to Dark Knight. I don't, uh, I don't <laughs> revisit Dark Knight Returns that often. Um, although the animated that they just did for DC Universe are really cool. Yes. Uh, I mean, that's. I mean, I tell you what. That's. I mean, as far as those DC Universe animated, you would. Ne- oh, here's another thing you can take away from this: watch All Star Superman. It's the best Superman movie that's ever been made. Period. Okay. I mean, it's period. All Star Superman is the best Superman film I've ever seen, and it's absolutely. And it's the. Are you guys familiar with the story? I am. Okay. What do you? I mean, did you see it, Nick? I have, but I'm not going to say anything. So because I don't. If our listeners haven't, but yeah, no, I agree. It, no, again, I don't like Superman, but yes, very well done. Yeah. So I mean, what gets you know? Hey, we're here. I mean, you, you, I'm not going to cry if you disagree with me. But uh, so you know, so so if I'm if I'm if I'm spewing shit, call me out on it. Oh no, no, I'm not, I, it's, it's not that. I just don't want to ruin it for anybody. I wouldn't want to ruin it for anyone other than to say, and I, I mean, don't, well, I'll just go ahead and, and ruin this part of it. It's, uh, it's the last Superman story. I mean, and the last Superman story has been told a number of times. Um, you know, Alan Moore did it in uh, Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow. You know, and, and Elliot Magan has done, uh, we know, what, I mean, a story that could be the last Superman story. He wrote the last crypto story once, and uh, and that was phenomenal. So, I mean, it's somebody who is envisioning um, what would be the last Superman story, and it's uh, and it's wonderfully done. So as far as Chris. Christopher Nolan. I think what Christopher Nolan did for uh, for Batman was really important because he did. Sometimes we can do a superhero movie that uh, we don't realize it's a superhero movie because people aren't in costume. Name of the Rose is a superhero movie. Name of the Rose is probably the best Batman and Robin movie that's ever been made. And if you watch it. With that filter in place, you'll know what I mean. Sean Connery and Christian Slater are uh, are the coolest Batman and Robin that have ever been around. I mean, I think that Dark Knight was the – Dark Knight itself, not so much Batman Begins, was the first movie that didn't need costumes. You know, I mean, if nobody changed into their costumes to fight and it was just two people, you know, having their, uh, you know, for want of a better word, uh, battles, it would have been just fine. I mean, if Bruce Wayne just uh, – you know, wore a business suit like James Bond or something, and uh, and the Joker just had scars like Blofeld. Um, we would have thought it was another action movie, and we would have thought it was a yeah. good one. Yeah. Um, you know, and so so what Nolan did for superhero movies was hugely important because he legitimized it. Now that I mean, because without the Dark Knight, we couldn't have had the Avengers, and with the Avengers, that brings us back to Silver Age superhero storytelling, and uh, and and that's where I think is the is to, because audiences couldn't figure out why they liked the Avengers so much, and they liked the Avengers so much because it was funny, and uh, we haven't had a truly funny character-driven laugh superhero movie maybe ever except for Superman 2 might have been the last time it worked well I think too uh, it was a um, a set of writers and a director who understood character comes first mm-hmm. you know that they built from the character up you can it doesn't matter the one thing about Shakespeare is that the character I've always heard Shakespearean actors talk <laughs> I married a guy who you know, specializes or got a master's degree in like Shakespeare. The the one thing that's kind of beaten into everybody's head is Shakespearean characters are larger than life. Yeah. They are even if they're supposed to be real characters like kings, they're still supposed to be and they were written to be larger than life. And yeah. the the object is is how do you play or how do you get a how do you care about a character who's larger than life? And that is as the actor and as the writer or whatever, you take a larger than life character and you make them human by overplaying what it is that makes them human. So, you know, is it their pain? Is it their suffering? Or is it their heroism? Or is it their, you know, what is it that's the thrust of the actual story? And then you you make that larger than life as well. And all of a sudden you realize, oh, okay, well, that's just part of his character. I but, think that's exactly the way it was in Avengers. And it's exactly how it works in Star Trek, too, you know, with some of the captains. You I, know, you I play argue that's correct. Yeah. And the, the, the Marvel Cisco model was literally a god. <laughs> yes. 
Yes. But the Marvel model of superhero storytelling is exactly what you described, Terry. It's precisely that. But the thing is that so many people didn't read comic books. They didn't know. And and right. now the Avengers, you know, and that and the movies leading up to it were starting to think, wow, we really like these. Well, yeah, no shit, because they're Marvel comics the way I mean they're Marvel movies the way the Marvel comics treated the characters. And and so now we get it. Allegedly the next Captain America movie is gonna be a political thriller. And I think that's gonna be great. That's awesome. Um you know, I mean and you know this, oh go ahead. No, I was gonna say you say that I think to me the best scene in Avengers, and there's a lot of good ones, is the moment where Tony Stark tells Captain America, you're the captain. You're in charge. Yeah. It was just such a goosebump moment. My biggest goosebump moment in the Avengers was all the different times that everyone was trying to relate to uh, Bruce Banner as the human yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and trying so hard to make sure that, hey, you know, I mean, we know that when you hulk out that you're not necessarily responsible for your shit, but that, that's okay uh, because, you know, you're smart and you're this and you're that. And I really loved that part. And, but my goosebump moment was when they were fighting and somebody said, uh, I can't remember now if it's Cap or whoever, said, you know, well, I hope you can get angry. And he turned and yep. said, that's the secret. I'm always angry. always angry. And I was like, holy crap. I mean, because then all of a sudden you, you absolutely understand what it is that Bruce Banner has to live with his whole life. Wow. He doesn't have to work to hulk out. He has to work to keep from hulking out. Keep from- and, that's, and that's a great hero. The, and, uh, oh, and my gosh. Yeah. Bruce, so what you're telling me is that Bruce Banner as a human is really Vulcan. Uh, yes. <laughs> Well, and Hulk also had the funniest moment in that movie, in the train oh, station with Thor. Oh, yeah. yeah, I heard about that. I haven't seen it yet, so don't... Oh, it's okay, uh, it's okay. No, I don't mind it's, spoilers. It's a hilarious moment that I literally... I applauded. I applaud it. Oh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's just well done. But again, you know, to try to bring this back around to, uh, to Star Trek, you know, it's very much... I mean, if you look at the, uh, the archetypes that make up the, uh, the Senior Seven of original series, they, every one of them represents something that's larger than life, and that's what makes them fun to watch. But when we see things like, you know, I mean, Captain Kirk having to wear bifocals and, you know, and Spock crying because he never told his mom he loved her, you know, and, and McCoy recognizing that, you know, the, the one failure he had as a healer was to save his own parent, you know, and, uh, and, you know, and Scotty trying to come to terms with the fact that he, that he may have murdered somebody, you know, and, uh, and, you know, and just right on down the line, you know, I mean, Sue, I mean, Uhura questioning her sanity at certain levels of things, you know, there's, I mean, you can go, you can pick out points in all these, in all these places where um, you know they were humanized, and, uh, and and that's one of the reasons why we we come back and relate to them. That's right. That's right. And we wouldn't laugh. We, I mean, if somebody was seeing Star Trek three and they'd never seen Star Trek ever, you know, you're not going to laugh at "Don't Call Me Tiny," but we're rolling <laughs> in the aisles. You know, I mean, you know, and Abrams pulled a lot of that stuff in to make it work. Don't call me tiny is gets the same laugh as uh, you're under arrest cupcake. You know, I mean, it's the same laugh because you're turning the name back around, you know, that that somebody called to, to pick at you. I watched uh, Star Trek, the uh, the 2009 movie, with uh, a friend of mine who had never seen it. This was on Saturday. Had never seen it and had never seen an episode of the original series. I mean, this was like her entry point into it, you know, beyond knowing the stuff that we know for pop culture. And pound for pound, you cannot pick another television show beyond the original series where the average person who's never seen it recognizes a dozen things that have entered into pop culture. They've never seen Star Trek, but they know what Beam Me Up Scotty means. They know yeah. what phasers on stun mean they know what I've got my shield up means you know and that's just the technological crap you know <laughs> but the uh, but there's all sorts of that kind of, but but JJ Abrams made Star Trek accessible the Avengers made comic book heroes accessible and that's what that's what we need for these characters to endure uh, elementary is making Sherlock Holmes accessible in a way that goes even beyond what Sherlock did in BBC whether you like the show or not People are picking up uh, Arthur Conan Doyle's work for the I first know. time, even more so than the Robert Downey Jr. movies drove it to him, because yeah. they want to see what worked then so we can figure out why it works now. Well, yeah, we, I'll, I'll say that's ahead. true. No, I mean, that's, he, yeah. that is true, and that's part of the reason why I am grateful for 
the JJ films is because it has made the it has made Star Trek accessible to a generation that didn't get a television show. It also and Sherlock, I guess, is doing the same thing. I didn't realize it, but yeah, it's true. See, I'm I unfortunately in my head I still have to get over the purest hurdle on that because you got to give that up Terry every generation uh, has the permission to remake heroes their you're, you're going to have to understand though when it comes to Arthur Conan Doyle I mean I have I have a first edition you know it was the gift from my great great grandfather or my great grandfather it was like that was me was, wow. I was given Sherlock Holmes as, yeah so okay, that's- Cool. <laughs> See, I have a first edition signed DVD of Behind the Green Door, but that's... <laughs> really? You mean like Marilyn Chambers signed? She used to dance in my hometown because she's from Connecticut. Are you oh, being... oh, man, I'm not worried. She danced at the, she danced at the Log no, and Lantern no. in Yantic, Connecticut. That's freaking awesome. I'm sorry. That's cool. That's hey. pretty darn cool. That is pretty cool. My dear Nick, do you happen to have the list of questions? I do. Now, got Kevin, do you watch? Do you watch Inside the Actors Studio? You know, I've seen it a few times, but uh, I'm not a regular watcher. We have our but James Lipton like, yeah, we have our James Lipton like questions. Oh, uh, this is awesome. That he does. So, okay. and we call these the Dayton questions, inspired <laughs> by your heterosexual life partner. Yes. <laughs> so the should I answer the question, what you think I'm going to answer? Is this like the no, only no, way no. Answer them honestly. Answer no, them answer honestly. Them. And the, yeah. the first question I think is... I kind of answered Dayton one question. already, so... Yeah. The first question is the Dayton question. Where do you get your ideas? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> that, that, we ask after. every author that James Swallow threatened to stab me in the throat with an ice pack. Ooh. Um, I mean, yeah. to, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I get my ideas because I surround myself with uh, with creative people, and that's what is truly – I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's like flexing every muscle. I mean, the people who do well when they work out are ones who work out with partners. Um, you know, the people who uh, – I think the people who can come up with the best ideas are the ones who are the freest collaborators and I surround myself with a lot of creative people and that's where I get my ideas that's awesome that is cool that is an awesome answer. your favorite Trek series is I'm very much uh, you know what I'm, I'm I'll blow your mind here for a second if I if I had to wa- if I could only walk away with one season or one series uh, you know uh, in hand and have to abandon the rest I'd take the animated <laughs> Cool. Wow. My, High five. I mean, that was, my, that was my entry point. I didn't know Star Trek was a live action series when I started watching the animateds, or at least, I mean, I wasn't wasn't truly aware of it. The animateds are my comfort zone. I mean, you know, they're the, awesome. the things that I embraced when I was a kid, and I would take those. There's some good stuff there. There is. I, stuff there. I agree. Um, There's some you know, the, great, great stuff in there. Yeah. It was really kind of a perfect storm. I mean, there was a writer strike, so really great writers uh, needed opportunities to work, and they were able to work in uh, in Saturday morning TV in ways that other people they had. I mean, he hired Dorothy Fontana, and Dorothy Fontana knows how to run a show. And uh, you know, I just I have a great, great admiration, and I have I was very, very lucky when I first started working for Star Trek Communicator, which was the magazine for the uh, official Star Trek fan club back in the day. The uh, first story that I you know, full length big story that I pitched, not the first story that printed, was to do the write up on the twenty fifth anniversary of the animated. So I got opportunities to interview Lou Scheimer, Norm Prescott, and Hal Sutherland. Uh, uh and I have great great admiration for those gentlemen uh, and the storytelling that they had because pound for pound, you can't tell a story unless you can tell it to a kid. And those guys knew how to tell a story to a kid. And, uh, you know, I mean, for, for me, you know, being nine years old at the time, I started watching it. You know, I mean, my formative stories, I mean, the thing where I, where I cut my teeth on figuring out the kind of stuff that I wanted to watch, you know, week to week, you know, Space Ghost, Johnny Quest. Um, oh, Space the, Ghost. Uh, yeah. um, I mean, Herculoids. You know, like, Anime. Oh, big fan of Herculoids. You know, I love the, the Hanna Barbera and uh, and filmation uh, uh, cartoons of the uh, of the '60s and and '70s, where where I learned how to tell a story. That's awesome. Yeah. I just watched Johnny it, Quest a couple weeks ago. Isn't it great? Oh yeah. <laughs> what did you th- don't you think that Johnny Quest? If you said it, think of Johnny Quest in the era of Doctor No. If you said Johnny Quest in the era of Doctor No and told that story, wouldn't that movie make a mint? Oh yeah. Absolutely. I, to be honest with you, if there's ever if there's ever a show that could really use a nice shiny live action, not even live action, I would say to go in a nice new animated format. Either or, I'd go oh. either or, but I wouldn't make a contemporary. I'd make Johnny. No, I'd no, say, no. It has to have that jazz music, or else it's done. Got it. 
got to have the yeah. jazz music. It's got to have. It's got to have the. It's got to have the Doctor No era. It has to have that camp to it because it wouldn't uh-huh. work otherwise. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, how can you go wrong with those creepy frogmen? Ah, so oh, awesome. sorry. I'm just. I'm reminiscing because I really was a huge Johnny Quest fan. I still am. Still am. I think. Well, uh, it is what I. I have, I have a. I have a Johnny Quest. I've, I've on my desk at work. I have McFarland figurine of Johnny Quest and the Rocket Pack uh, going, taking his knife after the pterodactyl with the bandit cowering on the on the on the on the rocks. See, and I think that yeah. it's really what started my love of beards. <laughs> I'm not kidding. You were a so, Doctor Quest girl and not a Race Bannon girl. <sighs> Yeah. Okay. If you could be any species in Trek other than human, mm. what species would you be? What would I be? You know, uh, gosh, that's a great question. Um, you know, when I was a kid, uh, when I was a kid, I definitely identified with Spock and the Vulcan side, and I'll tell you why. And I don't mean this to sound all all syrupy and crappy, but when my parents divorced, I didn't want to cry about it, and uh, and so Spock had this idea of you know, well, you know, I have to show emotions, and uh, and so uh, you know, I kind of I connected to Spock for the wrong reasons, as my therapist points out. Um, <laughs> the the uh, but gosh, I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to I'm trying to be glib and come up with something. Thing. You know, I'll be honest with you. I think I would want to be. I think I'd want to be a Medusan. I think uh, I'd. Be, I, 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 wow. I think I'd want to be not tied to a corporal form. Yeah. Well, Mike would want to be a Klingon. I mean, that's yes. that's for that. Or a score. Yeah. Ooh, I would be. That's a great yes. I like that answer too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would be Rehan. Score from the animated series. Oh yeah. I would be Rihansu. Okay. Be. Yes. And I'm currently reading that series. And I, I did you read that uh, series? I did. And what a wonderful way to imagine um, a uh, an entire universe within a universe. Um, and I, what, I love the the Horda lieutenant from the Enterprise. <laughs> the, the ongoing joke every time Commander Al sees him, she's she's got a soft spot for the Horda, the Romulan <laughs> commander, which is just phenomenal. Phenomenal, Terry. What would you be? You've never answered. I, I think you know you would be a fabulous Troyan, but <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah. touch my tears. I don't know. I haven't. I haven't really. To be honest with you, I never really thought about it. I would have to say probably Ryzen. Ooh. Right and on, I think right that tells our audience all we need to know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, if you were given an opportunity to write an open-ended series based on any one character in Trek, who would it be? Uh, on screen or off? I don't think it matters. When it comes to, I think we left that open. It could be yeah, a, I think a novel did. character. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll cheat and just name any random character from Vanguard because I would, I would love to – I mean – I, it doesn't have to be Vanguard, but I would love to see a. I would love to see something set in the Star Trek universe uh, made for cable. You know, with, not necessarily HBO, but uh, yeah. you know, if we. I mean, if great storytellers can get attached to a concept um, that you know drives a show like The Walking Dead, then great storytellers can get attached to a concept uh, behind the idea of uh, of what Vanguard's what Vanguard tried to do. And, uh, and Shamwell, can somebody give me a Shamwell? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would I would go with Captain Jellico in the USS Cairo, but that's me. Ooh, that's cool. Uh-huh. I don't know. Well, you know me. I would also, I, for me, I, I, I listen to Kevin, and I think it would just be, you know, an amazing open world kind of thing for, for Star Trek, even set in the Vanguard area. Oh, God, that would be awesome. Yeah. Okay. Now, you're a starship captain. The name of your ship is the USS... Oh, see, Dayton would want me to say butt plug so badly right now. <laughs> Speaking of which, I saw David Max rat tail butt plug at Farpoint. So good call on that. Uh, looks like we lost Kevin. Oh no! Oh, no, he must have unplugged his phone. We lost him at butt plug. Oh my God, that's, <laughs> that is so G and T. You know what? It was it was Dayton. You mentioned Dayton. He, bro- he broke. I didn't his- mention him. He mentioned him. Dayton broke the interview. Oh, my God. He did it again. What the hell, Dayton? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That was hilarious. Well, he said he would have to leave in about an hour. Maybe that was it. He wanted to go. I don't think he left without saying goodbye. <laughs> I'm, I'm asking him. Go out and talk about butt plug. I didn't I tell you, this didn't show. I tell you it's just, awesome? What would you say? This is what it was like in the bar with him and Dayton. And uh. Matt. <laughs> it was like the Algonquin Roundtable. 
Oh, that's awesome. Are you there? We're bringing him back. There he yeah. is. I don't know what happened. All of a sudden, I, I mean, Dave broke like, the show again. You said day in, and it broke the show. I know, man. He's a jinx when he's not on it. You know? I um, I did see David it's, it's, Max. It's, it's, it's his revenge for all those arguments you lost. Uh, <laughs> I did see David Max rat tail butt plug at uh, the Far Point convention. <laughs> I was so proud of that find. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, you said something. You know, I I dropped the the joke, and you said speaking of which, and, and then yeah, that's what I was saying. Is yeah, I saw the butt plug. Ah, the butt nice. Plug at the uh, oh, a couple of weeks ago. You know, you know what I do, and this again, this will be hokey. I'd go with the level because that was the first ship we ever named. The uh, or at least it's the, it's the ship that I remember naming. We were walking through a, uh, I'm pretty sure it was a Borders. You know, just kicking around uh, stuff about uh, SEE in general, back and forth. Just you know, I mean, usually when we uh, when we brainstorm stories, we'll go shopping. We'll, we'll wander. I mean, we'll go eat a Buffalo Wild Wings, and then we'll just kind of wander our usual haunts, comic book stores, used bookstores. Really, are two old women, aren't you? Oh, I love God. it. Yeah. You know, I mean, shoot, I came up with a whole subplot of a book while I was taking a piss once. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> was that the great asparagus subplot? Is that what that uh, was? Yes, exactly, yes. Yeah, the, <laughs> the, yeah it was, it was the, the, uh, the Urinati from... Uh, from, from, <laughs> from uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm not even finished with my beer. Uh, yeah, and then, and then we—I don't remember if uh, one of us walked past a book or something or whatever. But I—I uh, I truly can't remember which of us said it first. But uh, said, "How about the level?" And uh, you know, with the whole idea of just doing—you know—why wouldn't an engineering ship be, uh, you know, at least one somewhere uh, be dedicated to uh, you know the uh, the person who uh, helped uh, command the uh, the the greatest. Uh, you know, uh, extraterrestrial engineering feat of, of of our lifetimes. So that was so. Yeah, I, I'll just I'll name my ship the level just just because. That's cool. Okay. Right on. Do you have a favorite adjective? Do you overuse it? Isn't there an adjective you loathe? Ah, adjective. Um, gosh, I don't know. I mean, I, I have a few nouns that I tend to. You know, this is, I know. <laughs> I say awesome a lot, and and you know, and so uh, you know, and that's not really an adjective. I'm trying to, I just throw stuff in. God, I don't know. Uh, you hit me with word questions. I'm I'm really shitty at scrap. <laughs> yeah. Secret <laughs> names. Um, Who knew? We throw yeah. words in at at a writer. Yeah, uh, <laughs> adjective. I, you know, they say that uh, that the average person has a pretty limited vocabulary when it comes to uh, you know what they really use on a daily basis, and my guess is that mine's even even uh, more limited. Yeah, I, I might have to like default on that. Uh, I know that there's that people have words that they don't like. Like I mean, it seems it seems hip to say you don't like the word moist, kind of like it seems hip to say I don't like clowns. You know, I mean that's, that's you know I mean okay, so I'm scared of clowns. I, I'm not, but you know people say that. And it's like, okay, well, you know, I got kind of a, a finger shaking at work the other day because uh, um, somebody had sent out a, a, a email about uh, you know, this kid who decided to disengage from or this video about a kid who decided to disengage from social media so he could talk to people one on one. I said, ah, you know, I don't do social media as this year's I quit watching cable. Um, you know, it's just, the, you know, damn hipsters. Um, <laughs> the, yeah, I don't know. I don't, there's no word that, you know, there's no word that offends me, but I hate when words aren't used well. So, yeah, so I guess my, my least favorite adjective is, is one that's, that's not used properly. And, and my most, the, the, the one I love the most is the one that surprises me, I guess. Cool. All right. And our final in the, uh, the great questions, if you are given the green light to kill a major Star Trek canon character, mm. who would you pick? Wow. And the last time I asked this question, I cried for three nights straight at the answer. Wow. <laughs> I had no idea that uh, the Beagle meant so much to you. Uh, <laughs> no, that you know, be- I'm going to cheat a little bit. I would kill the character whose story I think is finished. We don't have many opportunities to uh, walk away from a character whose story is finished as keenly example or exemplified in the second season of Heroes. The uh, I mean, there's just you got to know when your story's done. They're killing Robin this month. Spoiler alert! In, uh, nah, it's uh, been all over the internet. Yeah, it's all over the internet. Uh, Dam- Damian Wayne is going to get killed. And comic book deaths are meaningless nowadays because they just bring him back. If they're 
going to bring back Barry Allen. They can bring back anybody, and uh, and so comic book deaths to me are meaningless. But there are uh, uh, characters whose uh, you know story is finished. I never read the book where they killed off Chewbacca. I don't know why they did it. Um, I don't know that they needed to do it, except that they wanted to get some press. You know, hey, we killed off Chewie. So you can tell I'm just stalling for time. I'm trying to think whose story is finished. The uh, Beverly. <laughs> oh, is that a hint? No, I don't. I, I'm trying to think of uh, who's. Uh, I thought that the way they did it was crappy, but I didn't have any problem that they killed off Trip. Um, I didn't either. And uh, and and I thought that's okay, even though they engineer they had to engineer the death of. Uh, Let's just put it this way: we could have done it better. Oh, <laughs> yes, sure. I believe I I truly believe that. Um, I you know I think Kirk's death could have been done better, but mm-hmm. I would argue that uh, the way you pass the baton is make sure the audience knows that his story is over. And I think it's okay that his story is over. But then again, you know, I mean, Patton, an incredible life, an incredible story, and he dies in a car accident. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, that's like, what? But, you know, that's, that's truth. Or the bowler Earl Anthony fell down a flight of stairs and died. Yes. There you the go. The guy bowler who, of all time. The guy yeah. who bought the Segway, you know, uh, rode a Segway off a cliff. The, uh, <laughs> yeah, we all have, you know, many people have, uh, what's, what's, how do you say the word, ignominious ends. Yeah, I guess, I guess, so I would gauge that with the character who, upon more analysis, I decide whose story is over. I would not say that Riker's story is over because the Titan books prove that's not true. I mean, Dayton is doing things with Picard that are more interesting to me than uh, what has been done with uh, with Picard of late because uh, he's reaching out to tell uh, Picard stories through the eyes of a parent and which I think is really really cool. There's I mean there's ways you can freshen characters, but if somebody decides they don't want to freshen a character and they just want to end the story, you know, um, whose story is it? When I took fiction writing class, um, one of the things that my uh, professor I was very blessed with the opportunity to take fiction writing from uh, from James Gunn at the University of Kansas who is, you know, one of the, the greatest science fiction scholars that's ever lived. And, uh, and he told me that, you know, the story you're telling is the most interesting thing that has ever happened and will ever happen to the main character of your story. And uh, that's pretty hard to do, Captain Kirk, but yet people, great storytellers, show us that we're not done telling interesting and fun stories about Captain Kirk. Yeah. Bored you all not at all. I'm no. We're, yeah, I'm, but no. But that's truly. Really, I mean, as I'm sitting here trying to formulate my answer. The, the closest I can get to is, I would I would gladly kill off the major character whose story I believe is done. You know, I mean, but I mean, Odo's story is done. What does it serve us to blow up the Great Link? You know, it doesn't. Just leave it alone. Just let it go. Who else's stories are done and that are just fine to leave alone? You know, we don't need to go. We don't need to find Kess to kill her off. We don't need to find Neelix to kill him off. Um, Didn't we say never that had much of a story? I'm sorry. Chakotay never had much of a story. <laughs> you know, that's, but that's that's their fault. That's yeah. their Didn't fault. Can we say then that Janeway? Would you like to kill Janeway because her story was done the minute they got to the end of that crappy episode. Uh, her story should not have uh, led her to the Admiralty. Exactly. I think that, uh, um, you know, but Poison. that's, yeah, but that's, you know, that again, that was, they needed a stunt casting for the movie um, and something that they thought that the fanboys would uh, would appreciate and it turned out we didn't. But why, but... I, I would mean, just like to say while you're, while you're stalling for time, beautiful Christine Thompson, I hope you're listening to this because Esri Dax's story is nowhere near over. Oh, there's no, <laughs> you're absolutely right. Thank you. Absolutely right. What a great character she became. Yes, uh, I mean, you know, didn't one, she? I mean, you know, one season of TV, and she outacted the previous performers six seasons, and made us embrace a character that in, <laughs> that in reality is uninteresting. <laughs> what? He, he loves Esri. I I two years ago in Vegas, I had the pleasure of not only. I got to spend 15 minutes in a bar one-on-one with Nicole DeBoer. Nice. I interviewed her. I, I was her first interview. Isn't um, she awesome? She's wonderful. She lets me call her Nikki, though, so in your face. Uh, <laughs> she called me a hero. Well, you are. Oh, I'm not. No, You've well, met me. I am not. 
I, I mean, you gotta I, start I mean, out of me. I'm put up with Terry. Any, any, anyone who puts who, anyone who puts their life on the line so I can continue doing the bullshit that I do, you know that. I, I, I did Harry twice. That was that far scarier than ever going to combat. Oh, I'm not saying that. I mean, you know, but but hell, I mean, there's I mean, there's plenty of things that I could do with less fear than you might experience if if you were to do, you know. But uh, you work Comic Con. What's that like? It's, it's actually it's a lot of fun. Everyone <laughs> find me, but no. No, Nick, I mean, seriously, if you're – don't – well, t- we'll take this offline. I just say that – uh, You that did our, post a photo a few years ago, I think two years ago from Comic-Con. Terry, you know the photo I'm talking about where he had the biggest shit-eating grin on his face, and it was with a couple of women that were cosplaying. Yeah. Oh, oh. was it Comic-Con? Yeah, yeah it was at Comic Con. Or was it at the uh, Star Trek um, premiere party that we had uh, here in Kansas City? I was uh, sandwiched in between two women in Orion paint. That was pretty hot. I, oh, I, I had it on in Vegas where these two female Orions, I, every year I'm taking a picture kissing their feet. Speaking, Whoa. Of, Vegas, speaking of Vegas, you yeah. are yeah. going to be attending the Star Trek Las Vegas convention this year. Yes, yes. Our plans, as they are right now, is that yes. The only thing <laughs> that would affect that would be uh, whether. Uh, I can uh, sneak away at that time of year and, uh, you know, in relating to getting my daughter moved into her first apartment and uh, stuff like that for uh, for college. For college. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Now, but she's living in the dorm. But the, the aim is that for her sophomore year, she's going to get a, a town home with a couple of friends. And I don't want to necessarily be uh, traipsing around if, uh, if she could use my help. So that's okay. the only thing I got to gauge against. Once I figure out when the lease is and when she can move in, then I'll, uh, I'll lock it down for absolutely sure. Great. And I will be I... great because my daughter turns 10 next week. So. Oh, hey. What a good <sighs> year. to it. Yeah. It's... Well, it's a great milestone. So, uh, um, yeah, enjoy this. I mean, this is. I have to take her to the Taylor Swift concert, Kevin. Hey, no, you don't have to. You get to because uh, you know I took my daughter to a Weezer concert, and it turns out that now we have a band that we both like. You're... That's Weezer. Yeah, but well, <laughs> that's Weezer. That's, Free, you know, the rest will follow. You know, the uh, I mean, it's one of the one of the <laughs> great. Jokes. At one least the, she didn't ask me to take her to Bieber. Oh, you know what? I'll bet that's a hell of a show. You know that Dayton and I uh, met Justin Bieber last time we were in Vegas? Really? Hold yeah. On. Wait, what? What? <laughs> um, the uh, last time we were in Vegas, which would, which we flew in the morning after the uh, Billboard Music Awards, we decided that uh, – or actually, we flew in the day of, I guess, because we, ro- we were roaming around uh, casinos, and, and we were roaming around MGM when uh, the uh, Billboard Awards were happening on site. So the next day, we decided we were going to walk off the strip to the Pinball Hall of Fame, which was something that, in theory, sounded great, but in practice – it really was was straight out of Technical Sergeant Hartman and Private Pile with, the, <laughs> with coaching me through uh, triple digit heat down a, a four mile walk to the uh, to the to the pinball place. So uh, we stopped uh, to get some Gatorade at a building that turned out to be the uh, the terminal for charter planes. Uh, there's several of them that are kind of uh, are on the perimeter of McCarran. And uh, we went in and grabbed uh, a Gatorade and stood outside in the shade drinking it. And this uh, Escalade pulls up and a driver jumps out and uh, walks around the front, kind of looks around, opens up the side door, uh, out pops uh, this uh, kid with a, uh, you know, I mean, it was hot. He had a gray hoodie with the hood up and shades on and decked out in sweats and stuff. And I thought, okay. And the next kid pops out and uh, he's got a uh, black sleeveless shirt, kind of a hat pulled down a little bit over his eyes, and dog tags. And uh, they start walking toward us, and the, and the kid uh, looks up, and uh, it's Justin Bieber. So I said, hey, how you doing wow. today? And he says, pretty good. I said, good to see you. And uh, they walked in. So now, uh, there you go. Here's a question <laughs> for you, because you, you, you've done a lot of conventions, Comic-Con, you, you, you know, Shore Leave, the, you go to Denver. Do you still suffer, because I know after Vegas we do, post-convention letdown? It's not so much a letdown. It's just that this is the uh, – any of you guys uh, take the uh, Myers-Briggs personality test? Yes. I, yeah. Okay. So Myers Briggs has four uh, definers: uh, introvert versus extrovert, intuitive thinker versus I think it's emotional thinker, then uh, thinking versus feeling, and judgment versus perception. I forget what the, I I may have goofed that all up, but no, you get uh, it. I rank as an introvert on that scale, which huh. uh, you? which I, I do, and. Yeah. Uh, 
and and basically what that means is not so much it's not defined by how you handle yourself in public or or that kind of thing. It really just defines on where you draw your energy. And I do not draw my energy from crowds. I draw my energy from uh, solitude. When push comes to shove, I'm a creator, and that's a, that's a solitary activity. So yeah, I I come back from conventions, and it's not so much a uh, a letdown. I mean, it's not like I'm crashing because I didn't get what I wanted for Christmas, but it's just it's very very draining. And there's you know sometimes I just come home and don't want to talk to anybody for a couple of days. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I do have one final question. Yeah, yeah. Um, are there any projects that you're working on now that you'd like our audience to be aware of or anything that you would like to be doing? Um, no, there's, there's probably something I'd like to be doing, but it's, <laughs> it's, I don't know if the audience wants to be aware of that. Um, the, uh, um, well, I can tell you a few things that are, that are happening. I have some children's books that are going to be coming out at Christmas time through uh, Hallmark. And, uh, and that's something, I mean, just in case people don't know, because we haven't really touched on but that's my real life job is that I'm a senior writer for the um, for the creative writing studio in Hallmark and so yes I write the cards the thing that I'm that I finished last fall that is now being illustrated by a wonderful illustrator find him on the web and check out his stuff Ralph Cosentino is a uh, series of books about a young superhero named uh, Cosmic Ray and uh, Raymond's a kid in elementary school who uh, through a series of events is united with some uh, a not of this world the technology that allows him to become a superhero called Cosmic Ray. And and so I've got three books in that series that are coming out. Oh, did we lose him again? We may have lost you for a moment. Kevin, are you there? Cross-circuit it through the uh, environmental life support systems. Try and get some more boost. <laughs> yeah, we're experiencing technical difficulties again. <laughs> Is the weather in, uh, in KC still pretty bad? There. Hey, there, there you are. are. Got this message that said, "Just a moment, while we reconnect to you." So something happened. It must have been aliens. Any event, the, those are coming out at Christmas. They're very much, you know, in the vein of Space Ghost, Johnny Quest, Frankenstein Jr., Herculoids. Uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, that kind of storytelling where anything and everything can happen. You know, I mean, very pulpish. And uh, they're for uh, readers ages uh, three, four, five, and six, um, and they're intended to be, uh, you know, uh, kind of multi generational. You know, the kind of things that, that parents and kids read together. I'm very excited about those. Really, really great. Maybe Make sure that we get the information as it comes out so we can help, you know. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Get the word out. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's yeah. awesome Walmart. because I, I know mean, you know, I've seen some of the, I've seen some of the promo stuff on this. Have I not? Is there a Facebook page or something that you guys uh, have? Not, not yet. The, uh, I mean, I, I did talk about it in a Facebook post once a couple of times. Maybe that was it. Yeah. Um, but uh, I haven't, I don't really have anything tangible to show yet. So okay. uh, yeah, once it gets closer. Um, That'd be I'll, awesome. Hallmark Gold Crown stores is where is where they'll be offered. Um, and can you give us any hints as to what maybe just a general generic hint as to what's coming this year as far as the official Star Trek ornaments? Uh, oh, absolutely. There's no. Uh, I don't need to hint at all. Um, oh, okay. Yay. I can absolutely tell you. There are three Star Trek ornaments that are coming out for 2013. But the first is we generally do a ship, a character, and a scene. And the ship is uh, the USS Kelvin. It's a wonderful sculpt <laughs> oh. um, by uh, by Lynn Norton, who's been sculpting Star Trek ships. The ship. beginning. And it actually looks really cool. It's one of those things that I never really knew. I mean, like I mean, I've never held the ship or looked at the ship. I mean, other than on screen and and the way it's shot. You're not even really sure, you know, how all the parts fit together, but but no, it's it's really cool. The uh, the character is uh, Scotty uh, holding one of his, uh, you know, the um, what I affectionately call the triple prong, you know that <laughs> you know that's uh, a big thing that he holds on that's got three uh, three yeah. yeah yeah it's got a name it's like a try blah that's something what is that what Miles used in Trials and Tribulations? It's very possible, yeah. That's cool. So, um, so that's that's the the fourth in the Star Trek Legends series, and our scene for uh, for 2013 is Kirk versus the Gorn, and uh, and not unlike our really popular ornament in 2011, which was Kirk and Spock with the uh, fight music from a mock time. From a mock um, time. This is music and uh, and sound effects rather than dialogue. So you're going to get another snippet of uh, of really great original series soundtrack music. Now, there you go. Terry, Very you cool. said something earlier. How great would a line of Captain Rabu books be? 
you know, Dr. Robau, are you? Yeah, yeah, you know, I think that'd be interesting. So, you know, to be honest, that was something that uh, I think Dana and I had even talked a little bit about. You know, if you know, it's like, hey, is that something we'd want to do? And, and I don't know if it is or isn't, but it sure was a uh, a neat ship and a neat crew, and we got just enough uh, um, a tantalizing uh, look at uh, at them and uh, and their assignment. You know, you, we I'd wanted buy him to if you wrote him in the Prime Universe. Well, <laughs> he was a dreamy captain. I can say that. You have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, well, I mean, I don't know that we can't say that he wasn't in the Prime Universe. I mean, That's you know, what I'm saying. You could just make it up and make, make wow. it Wow. See what you just uh, – you you elicited a talking squee from Terry. <laughs> well, it's funny because the dogs next door started to bark. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the, no, that, I'm teasing. The, no, uh, we're, we're not. Her dogs just passed out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> say they're in the house. But no, I, I mean, it's, I think absolutely is a ship that would be worth uh, exploring and could be fun. Am I the, the only one that just thought it was kind of a goofy looking ship, though? I mean, I loved it, but it just—I don't know. It looked like somebody I it was missed a potato head kit and. That it was goofy looking because it wasn't what we have been uh, geared right. toward. Uh, but you know, it, you know, I mean, imagine if, if somebody decided, okay, well today um, we're going to have an aircraft carrier, um, but the flat part is what's going to touch the waves and the and the, you know the you know everything underneath the the water line, the trim line or whatever is is going to be up in the air. Uh, ooh, isn't that funny? You know, that's and that's what threw us off. But you know, you got the engine on the bottom and the uh, and the secondary hull on the top. Just was was weird, but it's almost like they ran out of nacelle Lego pieces. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you know what, though, I'm a fan of the Franz Joseph stuff, the uh, technical manual, and uh, and I've always loved Scouts and Destroyers. In fact, um, if you look on the cover of the Classified, and I'll go ahead and take credit for this. I mean, there's a lot. Of, obviously, we always do things as a team in Vanguard, but I was the first guy to spit out that wouldn't it be cool to have a transport tug on the front of that cover during the construction mm-hmm. of uh, of Starbase 47. And sure, sure enough, Doug Drexler, um, you know, uh, I am not worthy to speak of his name, Mr. Drexler <laughs> indulged us with that as a preliminary of designs, and everyone loved it. So, uh, so yeah, that's uh, I felt pretty good about that's that. Cool. Yeah, so the Kelvin Arena and Montgomery Scott are our three ornaments for 2013. I do know what our ornaments for 2014. 20- 14 are, and they are equally cool, but uh, I can't tell you what they are until uh, we unveil them at Comic-Con. Uh, I was going to say, now, is there a special Comic-Con ornament this year? We will have we will have uh, Comic Con exclusives, and I don't believe it's a C. I'm trying to figure out what I can and can't say. See, all right. of a sudden I'm back in Baghdad with Nick. The uh, what? Can if you, I if say? you're not sure, don't play it safe. No, no, I'm fine. No, I mean here's is it the here's Aventine. The I'm sorry. <laughs> is it the Aventine? The uh, sure no. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what I can. I'll tell you what I can tell you that uh, that if you're if you're paying attention, it will make perfect sense. Last year we started the strategy and, and we didn't make a secret that we would do it again. That we're doing event exclusives rather than show exclusives. When we first went to New York in 2011, killed me. Um, killed me. Uh, well, I'm sorry. What? Yeah, I was going to say I'm still trying to get my hands on the uh, New York Defiant. Oh man, I love that ornament. That was my idea. That was my idea. We had to go with something that um, they were repaints. We didn't know we were going until late in the game. We couldn't do original skulls. We couldn't make new dyes. We had to go with what we had in inventory as far as how to get something manufactured. And mm-hmm. so we put our brains together and looked at what it was we had available and went with the uh, Star Trek exclusives and the Star Wars exclusives that we went to New York with. But in 2012, the same ornaments we had in San Diego, we also had in New York. And I can tell you in 2013, we're doing the same thing because we found that people liked it better. And our, our goal is to create excitement about keepsake ornaments uh, and what Hallmark does that's fun with uh, pop culture. It's not to piss people off and, and do things they can't, uh, make things they can't get. Right. I can tell you that uh, we are associated with Star Trek or the Star Wars Pavilion again this year, so there's a pretty good chance that uh, we're going to have uh, a uh, Star Wars ornament. I'll tell you that uh, a lot of our ornaments in the past when it comes to uh, our subjects for ornaments are anniversary years. So uh, if you know we're going to have a uh, Star Wars ornament and you know we like to do stuff in anniversary years, here, what if you're gonna put two and two together? What would you think, Nick? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, he's gone. No, oh, I, 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 I'm trying to. It's the 30th anniversary of Return of the Jedi. So let's see. Can you believe that? What? 
the really? incomplete the incomplete Death Star? No, no, no. I can't tell you what we're doing. I oh. Can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just the fact that, it, that, that I just can't believe it's been thirty years. Oh, I'm tripping out about that. That's wild. Uh, but no, we've, we've got uh, um, we've got uh, generally what we do is we do a Star Wars ornament, we do a comic book ornament, we do a um, anything else ornament. Sci-fi, pop culture, whatever it is you want to do, and uh, and that's our I love strategy. your Muppet ornaments. Thanks, I like those too. You're gonna love the 2013 one. It's uh, it's Kermit sitting on a log with the banjo singing Rainbow. Oh, right. <gasps> I have the Beaker Ode to uh, Joy yeah. on my tree. Uh, Isn't it good? So we have wonderful sculptors who love pop culture as much as any of us here, and we have come up with some great ideas. We have uh, the family truckster from National Lampoon's Vacation, complete with the dead lady on the top. Uh, we've, got, we've got our first ornaments from a lot of, of movies from the 70s and 80s. I'm trying to think of what we sneaked. Mork and Mindy has an ornament this year. Happy Days has an ornament this year. You know what? We did in 2012, we That's did right. the Trans Am, but we can't do Smoking the Bandit. But we did do a black Trans Am with a gold Phoenix on the, or Firebird, on, which I guess is the same, okay. on the hood. So, you know, I mean, but you can put two and two together on that. Uh, another Ghostbusters tournament, I think, this year. Do we have Ghostbusters tournament this year? I can't remember. We've got some great stuff. Uh, Animal House, uh, Office Space. There's a lot of great uh, um, uh, movies and TV shows that are being represented for the first time in 2013, so we're pretty excited. Uh, we're planning on being in New York and San Diego this year, and uh, you know, as far as uh, officially uh, uh, represented by Hallmark, I think the D23 is going to be another place that we'll be this year again, oh, which is, a, which is the Disney convention. Yeah, the Disney, yeah, the big Disney one. Yeah, we won't be at the big Barbie convention like we have been in past years because uh, uh, Hallmark uh, no longer has a license to produce uh, properties from Mattel, so we don't do. Barbie ornaments anymore. Interesting. Huh? Oh, well. So there you go. Yes. Very cool. Thank <laughs> you so much for, for uh, taking the time to sit down with us. And uh, it's, I feel like I'll get your geek on. Mouth kind of ADD'd all over the place. So awesome. I hope I cover No, no, no that's, that's the G&T great. show. Yeah, yeah, seriously, all it was was another GNT show. Welcome to our world. Well, hopefully that things will work out to be able to see you in Las Vegas. It, it looks like we'll get you the passes are yours. So, Thanks. yeah, yeah. And uh, so there we'll, will be we'll, vodka and beer. Yeah, I was going to say, let's put it this way. If you, there were a very comfortable chair for you at the GNT show booth. <laughs> and, well. uh, Volume. We already have a position set up next to Trek Radio, and they always draw a lot, so it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm planning cool. to steal the Captain Kirk chair and put it over there for you guys to fight over. <laughs> yeah, I think Rod uh, might have something to say yeah, about that. Don't, don't worry about Rod. I got Rod handled. Don't worry about it. <laughs> no, I got Rod handled. Much guys. Different. Different. Oh. You guys got you guys got Rod handled, and I just handle my Rod. So here oh. we go. <laughs> um, but no, it's, we're very much looking forward to Vegas and, and hanging out with all y'all, and, and we're uh, very excited that uh, you want to uh, bring us around. So, but but that said, any time, you know, I mean, if, if somebody cancels on you, if you know you're 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 sucking for ideas, you have, I mean, if no one else will come on, I'll be glad to come on, and you can uh, I'm happy to happy to drop by anytime you want. That's awesome. That's wonderful. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you so Appreciate much. your time. And this has been yet another in our series of supplemental logs, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining in, and we hope you enjoyed it. Joe Lontru. Couple of. Lontru. Uh,